Okay, my clock says three o'clock on the button. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello and welcome to a panel discussion focused on how COVID-19 is impacting the domestic supply chain. This event is a virtual online presentation being brought to you by the Niagara University College of Business Administration, the School Center of Excellence in Food Marketing, the Center for Supply Chain Excellence, and the Family Business Center, all in conjunction with the University Center for Career Services. My name is Jack Ampugia, and I serve as an executive in residence at Niagara University, teach MBA courses in supply chain management, and I also work as a consultant when I'm not teaching. Before we uh, get on with the show, uh, just a couple of little housekeeping details. Number one, for everybody online, please be aware that the event is being recorded for possible use in the classroom uh, when school resumes in the fall. Um, number two, please mute your microphones during the panel discussion so that we don't get any feedback. If you want to ask a question, there is a chat window at the bottom of my screen. I think yours is the same. Pose a question there. We've allowed time at the end in addition to the prepared questions. And if there are some good questions out there, I will work them into the discussion. So thank you everyone for attending. Now on with the program. Uh, today we're pleased to have three executives from supply chain companies. And although we didn't plan this process, all of the enterprises represented here today are family owned. Uh, we've got some people on the panel who are actual owners, others who work for the owners, but these are all regional players with, with big footprints nationwide, all of them uh, with, a, with a home base here in Western New York and extensive operations around the country. And the three panelists joining us today are Jim Mano. Jim is Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Sunwill Distribution based in Buffalo. And I'll make mention of the fact that uh, Jim and I were President and Vice President for the Buffalo chapter of the Council of Supply Chain Management Professionals for a number of years. So I cross paths with Jim quite often. He brings a lot of years of experience and extensive industry knowledge to this program. Our second panelist today is Mike Riccio. Mike is the Chief Marketing Officer with Leonard's Express, based in Farmington, New York, which is out toward Rochester. They are an asset-based business, uh, meaning that they have tractors, trailers, drivers, but they also have a non-asset-based side that uh, Mike will clue us into more deeply. And I also know from Niagara University's perspective that a number of our graduates have left the university upon completion of their degrees and have gone to work at Leonard. So we've had a long-term relationship between the school and Mike's company. And then our third panelist uh, is Bob Rich. Bob is president of Aurora Logistics, a division of Rich Products. And uh, one, of my, one of my former colleagues worked with Bob at Rich Products a number of years ago and have watched his career develop and watched Roar grow into a nationwide business. We're pleased to have each of you with us today and look forward to your comments. So with that, uh, the first question that I'm gonna begin with is, uh, and this will all go to Jim Mando. Jim, how has COVID-19 impacted the Sonwill business? What changes has your company had to make because of COVID-19? Thank you, Jack. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I wanna give you a little background about Sonwill. Uh, it's a family owned business as Jack had explained. About 75 plus years, it's been in the Western New York area. It's the Wilson family. Um, it is not related to the NFL ownership, Wilson family, but uh, been around and have evolved from being warehousing to a full 3PL warehouse services option. And we now have actually four businesses, the 3PL for our warehousing and distribution, value added services. We do fulfillment, refurbishment, um, and a lot of other related uh, value added activities for our current customers. We also have the ability to have cold and ambient storage. And uh, we've evolved from that to having a full transportation offering now. We used to have a transportation brokerage. We now are asset-based and brokerage. Um, our real estate development arm has continued to look for opportunities for us to expand to. We also have a mixed-use uh, office complex that we manage and support. 
And lastly, technology, which has become a very important part of our overall organization. Uh, the technology we have on site, we have, you know, in, in the past three or four years grown to a complement of about 12 to 14 full-time employees in our IT area. Their role is not just to keep our operations up and running, but to also support our customers in their needs. So in essence, we've pulled together a complete package and we're now promoting ourselves as the full enterprise solution. And we've been doing that uh, fairly successfully for the last um, probably 10, 15 years. I've been with the company for about 15 years in the role of sales and marketing. We have a portfolio and we've seen a number of things happening within our portfolios in the sales side. Um, we're starting to see a change in the ability to plan forward thinking with any kind of forecasting because of the uncertainty. Capacity requirements for the warehouse or even the transportation arm are currently um, as uncertain as everyone else is experiencing. So we're in constant communication with our customers and trying to understand all aspects of the supply chain that are impacting this. From an employee standpoint, we've been very successful in managing to uh, utilize work from home for a number of our uh, more appropriate positions and uh, the warehouse operations themselves have been able to be fully staffed. We've adopted all of the requirements that COVID had put in place as an essential uh, provider within the industry uh, with about 70 to 75 percent of our customers being food and beverage, so food grade required. Uh, we're very sensitive to the Food Safety and Modernization Act and how that's been uh, addressed within the COVID experience. So for us, it's been a, a constant uh, check in with a customer, um, figure out what their challenges are, see what we can do to partner with them on those in any part of those four segments of our business. Thank you, Jim. Before we move on to another question, Jim, there was a terrific article in today's Buffalo News, I'm sure, and many other news media, focusing on a brand new office being constructed and soon to be available for Sunwell's new headquarters. Perhaps you could give us a little insight into that facility and what the plans are for that, Jim. Yes, a uh, very exciting time for us. We're about six weeks away, seven weeks away of being occupying that facility. It's an opportunity for us to consolidate all of our administrative functions and support groups. So we're moving all of the um, customer service, sales, uh, transportation side for their uh, staffing, uh, technology, finance. So it's all going to be under one roof, which is what Pete Wilson's been looking for for a while. The facility will give us that opportunity to be uh, in that space and be able to grow from that space into uh, what our needs are going forward. And of course, the challenge now is what are going to be the office requirements going forward, given the COVID experience that we're going through. That's been probably the biggest issue for us is to make sure that what we're building is retrofitted or accommodating the requirements to ensure that we are in compliance and ensuring that we're not going to be in a position to deal with a virus um, from complications within our office. Thanks, Jim. And for the benefit of our audience, uh, let me stress one point that Jim made that uh, Sonwill was built as an asset-based warehousing company where they owned facilities, operated the facilities, but they have expanded into local trucking, they've expanded into brokerage technology. You're gonna hear the same message from, um, from Mike Riccio and from Bob Rich. Uh, there is no such thing as a one trick pony in logistics today. It used to be that if you're a warehousing company, you're focused on warehousing. If you're a trucker, you're focused on trucking. You're gonna see that the backbone of success for all three of these companies represented today is that they come to the table with a whole portfolio of offerings and if their customer is looking for a specific service, chances are that, that this company in the, in the mix here will be able to respond and say, yes, we can do that for you. If we haven't done it before, we'll figure out a way. Um, there are just so many needs on the logistics arena that it, uh, it does not behoove anyone to say that I only do one thing. Uh, that is not the formula for success. Mike Riccio, uh, Leonard's Express, uh, what has COVID-19 done to your business units? And what kind of changes has your company had to make because of COVID-19? Thanks, Jack. Thanks for having me on. Actually, you, before I get into that, you do bring up an interesting point. As I'm sitting here thinking, uh, Jim's company warehouses for my largest shipper, uh, and we work together. So my, my trucks uh, are at Jim's facility every single day. 
And uh, my trucks also haul product for Bob's company uh, on a regular basis. So not only are we friendly competitors, but we collaborate together on different things that need to get accomplished for mutual customers. So I would agree with you that uh, today there's no such thing as a one trick pony. Uh, real quickly, Leonard's is a, as, as similar to uh, Jim's company is as, as a family owned business. I'm part of the family that owns the business. I work with my three brother-in-laws and, and my wife who since got smart and retired and, 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 and left the logistics industry. Uh, we're, as you indicated, we are an asset based provider. We operate at this point in time, 480 power units and 900 uh, trailers, a mix of vans and reefer. Predominantly grocery and consumer goods is the bulk of what we handle uh, throughout the country. We do have a non-asset side as well, um, similar to uh, the other uh, gentleman on the call and a small little warehousing, uh, uh, small warehousing uh, service here over in the Rochester area. And we uh, are around 50-50 uh, non-asset to asset. So uh, we, we, we run a blended model. Uh, to answer your question, it's really kind of tipped us upside down, right? Initially, it was trying to figure out who could work from home, who couldn't work from home, um, who couldn't work from home because of, uh, was it a technology issue? Was it an environment issue, right? Did they have the proper work at space? Uh, did they have children at home? Uh, did they have, you know, you know, as simple as it seems, pets and other distractions? So we first had to figure out uh, how we could productively operate uh, the company being a trucking company. On our non-asset side, it was pretty simple to have those individuals work from home. On the asset side, it's a little bit more unique. It's a little bit more efficient to have the asset people together. A lot of the small nuances of running the trucks on a day-to-day -day basis gets lost when you are uh, working remotely. Um, we had to understand who was uncomfortable, you know, everybody has a different reaction to the current situation and we need to respect those reactions. Uh, we had to think about our driver force, right? How are we going to keep our drivers safe, keep them sanitized, we had to, you know, provide them masks, provide them hand sanitizers, uh, what kind of facilities were they gonna be going in and out of? And, and, and I know we're gonna talk later about customers, um, you know, but really we had to put the technology in place to get people to work at, from home who could work at home. About two thirds of our, our workforce, our employees that administratively were working from home, about a third were here in the office, uh, and then figure out a way to um, uh, make our drivers uh, feel safe and secure. And then, um, you know, as we are slowly reintroducing people back into the office, doing so in a manner that uh, is appropriate, providing the right, to, you know, the separation, whether it be uh, X marks on the floor, whether, you know, masks in the hallway, uh, you know, partitions where their people weren't six feet apart, getting people, re-engineering the, the facility to get people six feet apart, and, you know, just kind of really working all through that. And then, you know, who had, uh, who had underlying health concerns, whether it be themselves or somebody in their family, and then they were concerned about you know, coming in and out of the office and, you know, just trying to work through those one-on-one. -on -one. So it was a kind of a real whole host of uh, different issues that we just kind of dealt with and, and uh, you know, a, a lot like everybody on the call today. Thanks, Mike. Bob Rich, you come from a legendary business family. Your grandfather started Rich Products and built that into a worldwide enterprise, highly recognized and very valuable business. You've gone your own route. You built Roar Logistics from the ground up, had nothing uh, day one, and have built that into a very, very successful business. Tell us a little bit about how Roar goes to market, uh, what makes your company different, and what has COVID-19 done to Roar, and what kinds of changes have you had to make because of the virus? Uh, a lot of a lot of changes, a lot going on, Jack. First of all, I also want to thank you for uh, for having us on here. Um, you know, we were talking in the, the pre-meetings that this is sort of like a rogues gallery. I mean, we've, <laughs> we could take the show on the road. We've done so many different uh, events together with all our, our, our friendly uh, competitors here. But, uh, you know, that's one of the greatest things about the transportation industry. I think for the most part, everyone gets along great. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the guys at Sound and the guys at Leonard's are great. We're doing some awesome things together. And thanks to Jim Mano and his team that actually have uh, contributed. I called them up, I needed a trailer and being non-asset based, I don't have trailers. 
but uh, they contributed a trailer for the Amherst Meals on Wheels program. Uh, we're very happy to help us out, and the trailer's been sitting there for a couple months when this all hit. And I just heard that they're going to extend um, the trailer usage, uh, just like they're extending the border closing uh, through July and probably into early August. But uh, you know, thanks to Jim and, and the crew over there uh, at Sonwell for helping out. Uh, for Roar, really, what Roar was is um, obviously what you know, the uh, grandfather who's very successful in business, a father who's very successful in business, uh, both being entrepreneurs. My my father started our international division at Rich Products, and for me. Uh, Roar Logistics was really a proving ground um, and, and sort of the culmination of, of 20 years or so in logistics, which uh, started working for you, Jack. So uh, good, bad, or indifferent, here we are, and we're successful. So um, there's the old line about you taught me everything I know, and I still don't know anything. But uh, what I don't know, I don't know. What I do know, I do know. And what I don't know, I try to fake it. Um, so for us, you know, what we took at Roar was we took the approach as a family business, as these gentlemen all know, that there's a family pride in what you do. When you have a family company, um, you want to make sure that you take care of your customers just like you take care of your family members, and hopefully you get along well with your family members. Um, I get along well with my family members, so uh, in putting Roar together, we wanted to take what we knew at Rich Products about uh, food service distribution. We were a, uh, I believe it was five or six years, we were the uh, multi-unit food service operator award we won it in a row, Jack. So, um, a lot of that hinge, hinges on logistics. So what we did was we took a lot of what I learned in my career uh, at Rich Products and logistics and uh, what we've modeled from other successful uh, food companies. And we took an approach with Roar that we're going to attack logistics from the perspective of the shipper uh, more than of the transportation company. Uh, knowing that, that the expectations on our company as they are on uh, Leonard's and Sonwell, we've all got this high quality, high velocity, high service model. And that's based upon studying and getting to know our customers better than they know themselves. Uh, anyone can walk into a, a customer and, and try and sell them on transportation, but to truly understand what your customer's needs are is where uh, we feel that we excel because we take the time to learn our customers. We don't just go in and offer a low ball rate. Um, when COVID hit us, uh, we were sort of an interesting point. We have uh, an interesting situation in general. We have uh, seven different offices and we're in five or six different states. Um, and each of these states took different approaches. We have offices in Texas, we have offices in Georgia, as well as uh, Illinois, and then we're out in California, and then here in upstate New York. And the challenge that we have is, as each of these states responded differently uh, with the closing down and the pause, as well as the responding differently to the timing on the reopening, we've had a, a very distinct challenge of saying, okay, we've got people in Georgia as well as people in Texas, they're gonna be heading back to work. You know, the, the governor says, okay, it's okay for these states to start reopening. So we've had to sort of juggle the, uh, the process of reopening different offices at different times. Uh, for us, I think, uh, you know, I did a, a show, we do a weekly show called uh, What the Freight uh, on Facebook Live and on YouTube every Friday at noon. And uh, we had John Manziel on last week, an a, a amazing speaker and a, a student of the industry. And I asked him, I said, what one thing defines, you know, or defines what we've gone through and how would he, what one word, you know, would you use to sum up uh, a successful business uh, in, in times of a pandemic? And very much as these gentlemen said, uh, you know, the word he used was adaptability. Uh, you have to be adaptable. You have to take advantage of the technology. You start realizing what you can do when you're forced to do it. Uh, so for us, a lot of it was working around technology, was remote meetings, was uh, creating a, a, a situation where we've got 145 people scattered throughout the United States. So we've had to create the technology and a lot of using Zoom meetings or, or Teams meetings to, to stay in touch. Um, and, and for us being also a, an international freight forwarder, you know, we have some very, very focused lanes that we do, not only on the domestic side, but on the international side. And for, uh, for our international division, uh, we had to pivot and we had to uh, go beyond our favored trade lane that we really have deep penetration on, and that's the U.S. to Asia market. So we had to say, well, you know, Asia is shut down for business. We've got to develop other areas and other lanes and places that we can work uh, around the globe. We have to find other trade lanes that are going to work for us and where we can provide value for our customers. 
So really for us, the key to this whole thing in being successful, uh, aside from knowing your customer, I would have to say has been adaptability. Thanks, Bob. Uh, before we move on to anyone else, Bob, I've got uh, two questions for you, kind of piggyback. Sure. Uh, one, you talked about your adaptability and change. What have you seen from your customers? What kinds of things, and you deal with a lot of big companies nationwide. You mentioned all your offices. You've got a, a blue chip roster of accounts. What are you seeing from them in terms of their changes? And then also, uh, we talked early on that Sunwell has a brand new office coming you're in the same boat. You've got a brand new state-of-the-art office coming for rural logistics. I know the COVID-19 situation has slowed things down for you. Could you give us a little comment about the, your office situation and what that looks like to you in the near future? Sure. What we're doing, uh, we decided in our 15th year of business is we've outgrown uh, the last couple of space. We've been uh, down at the, uh, the Buffalo Grand Hotel for about 10 years. Uh, we started, uh, so it was our 15th anniversary last year. So as we've grown, we decided that we wanted to stay downtown. We're a Buffalo-based company. We wanted to be um, you know, in the city. So for us, uh, we put a stake in a piece of land that we had, uh, had purchased. Uh, it was sort of an oddball land. It was a, a piece of land sort of trapezoidal that uh, served really no purpose other than being a, uh, a, a storage ground for uh, used tires and other assorted garbage and uh, stuff along the track side. And we've, uh, we're putting up a 15,000 square foot building and we're gonna have 93 associates there, but we're gonna start a slow move back because we have to socially distance. So we'll probably keep some of our associates at home, spread out our dispatch operations and, and have people uh, move out a little bit. But we're Buffalo based, we're gonna stay here. Um, regarding our customers, you know, with a lot of our customers, and I'm sure that I, I know Jim and, and Mike, we, we share a lot of the same customers, we're very fortunate that a lot of our business was contract work. So we had guaranteed volumes and the customers we dealt with uh, for the most part uh, were the blue chip customers that were big enough that were able to uh, become deemed as uh, essential businesses. So in the beverage industry and in the food industry, people have to eat, people have to drink. And uh, a lot of our customers actually were deemed uh, essential businesses. So uh, we saw that a lot of the businesses stayed open um, in a lot of cases, we, we saw that really the, a lot of the protocol that changed uh, dealt mainly around uh, the drivers, the sanitation, being on the dock, being able to get a drivers don't even have to leave their, their, uh, their vehicles now. So they're at the point where they just bump the dock, uh, you know, they get on the radio, they're told, oh, you know, wait for it. And then uh, they're not even leaving uh, their, their cabs to, uh, to have to even check the freight. Uh, it's been a real, you know, a lot of the customers we've dealt with, I think, have taken a very uh, thoughtful and conscious approach, realizing that, you know, these drivers that are bumping the docks and running those miles out there have to stay healthy. If our drivers go down, our business goes down. And it, it, it rings very true, especially with uh, some of the asset-based guys like Mike's business and, and Jim's got some, they get some trucks. And, you know, so we've seen that the, the customers have had a major focus uh, on the drivers, which is probably the greatest thing. Uh, that could happen. So we're very happy about, uh, you know, the way our customers have responded. You know, other than that, like I said, you know, everybody out there is is uh, struggling through this together. So we've seen that there's sort of a shared consciousness with our customers to say that, hey, we're all in this together. Let's be a little bit nicer. Let's let's be in the know. Let's be in the now, and uh, let's take care of each other. So I think of anything really, our customers have become a lot more carrier friendly, which I know we all appreciate. Thanks for that very descriptive detail, Bob. Mike Riccio, Leonard's Express has customers all around the country. What kinds of changes is your company seeing from your customer base? Well, I would echo what uh, initially what Bob said. We've seen a definite uh, improvement in how our drivers are treated, right? There was a lot of good press on, you know, while they were working through the crisis and, and uh, and being all, uh, you know, hailed as heroes, and and we've seen a, a lot more patience by our customers, and how they deal with our drivers, uh, a lot more uh, friendliness to to those drivers. Um, but but to answer your question, uh, you know, like Bob, we have multiple facilities all over the country: uh, Chicago, California, Texas, uh, Delaware, Florida, and it, we we saw kind of a lot of volatility, right? So we haul we all we all toilet paper, 
You know, we all bananas and strawberries. You would think toilet paper, bananas, and strawberries were going to cure COVID. I was shocked at how much we haul a lot of fresh produce. A tremendous amount of fresh produce was moving. Um, but we haul a lot of food service business. And obviously, with the restaurants being slow that and, and closed down and, and doing takeout only uh, in a lot of states, uh, that created some challenges there. So our network was kind of out of whack. And, you know, we were able to, you know, really uh, adapt due to, running a brokerage and our, non, uh, and our assets. So we saw a lot of variability from our customers. Um, some of our customers were struggling. We, we, we haul a lot of fresh, not a lot of fresh uh, meat, but uh, you know, some chicken for some sizable, uh, some companies, it's Tyson and everybody knows about Tyson's issues. And so we had other customers who were having production challenges because they had to social distance and they were trying to figure it out or they had they had sickness within their facilities, their manufacturing facilities, so they weren't getting as much product out. We saw a lot of our customers obviously, you know, narrow down their SKUs and they were trying to figure out what to produce and how to produce it. And so there was a lot of just variability going on with that. You, you know, as things are going on, we're seeing some of the customers trying to take advantage of the, the current softness in some of the areas and trying to lock in some of uh, you know doing a, we're seeing a lot of bids being moved up uh, earlier than normal and people trying to lock in on some of the capacity that's available now right because car haulers and uh, you know auto haulers and and people who are hauling for the um, food and uh, for the uh, uh, food service industry are, are slower and so they're looking for work and so we're seeing some of some of those types of things going on um, you know, we had some challenges, you know, on, on, the, on the good side, customers, the driver didn't have to get out on the dock. He didn't have to get out of his truck. That Drivers love that. They don't have, they want to drive. They don't want to be, as everybody knows, bumped up against the dock and in the back of that trailer. The flip side, and, and we understand why customers were struggling with, how do we find a bathroom facility for our drivers? How do we, uh, from a sanitation standpoint, they couldn't let people in because they, they weren't sure how to deal with it, at least initially. And uh, now most of those customers have worked through those issues. But we saw a lot of variability depending on what the customer produced. Um, but thankfully, like Bob said, a lot of our business was essential and needed. And, um, you know, we went from very being extremely busy when all of the irrational uh, buying behavior was going on early on to kind of a lull and then back, you know, back on, a, you know, on the upward trough. So it just really depend on kind of what vertical you were talking about. Yep. Thanks, Mike. Mike mentioned uh, toilet paper in his comment, and we've all seen the shortages at the retail level, regardless of where you shop. A couple of weeks ago, we did one of these panel discussions focused on retail grocery. And the story that I'd like to share with everyone is that Joe Dash, president of Dash's supermarkets, regional chain here in Buffalo, the closest grocery store to my house is a Dash store. So the Dash Enterprise was unable to get toilet tissue from its normal sources. And through a secondary broker, they were uh, directed to a Procter & Gamble warehouse in New Jersey for a truckload of Procter & Gamble paper products, which they were very happy to get. But the pricing was uh, flat price coming out the door. You had to arrange for your own transportation. So the Dash organization contracted with a Western New York trucker to drive down pick up the load of toilet tissue and come back from New Jersey to Buffalo. Somewhere along the line, they got a phone call from the driver saying, I just wanted to let you know I'm on the job, doing what I can for you. I'm here at the warehouse. There is a three mile backup of tractor trailers waiting to get into that warehouse to make a pickup. So do not expect me back in Buffalo anytime soon. It's not because I, I'm shirking my duty or not wanting to haul for you. It's going to take me a long time to get to the dock. It may be a day's wait before I can actually pick up your product to bring it back to Buffalo. That's the kind of thing that's happening behind the scenes in the supply chain that the typical consumer would be totally unaware of. All they know is I went to the supermarket, there was no toilet tissue. It's not because the system isn't working. There's just tremendous demand that all these companies are having to deal with. So let me bounce to Jim Mano. Uh, Jim, your company has all kinds of big customers. You and I chat about them from time to time. What are you seeing from your customer base as to how they are reacting to COVID-19? Thanks, Jack. And uh, I guess the key here is similar to what uh, Mike was saying, 
On the transportation side, that piece of our business is driven by a lot of the same disruption and rethinking about lanes and product and movement and timing and scheduling of freight movement has become really a challenge. For us, we've got um, customers that are international and national. We've got customers that are regional and some that are local. The food and beverage ones are the ones that are the most challenging for us because they are seeing buyer behavior change. They are seeing uh, resources being constrained. And within that, they're saying, what makes sense for us to make, produce, market, and have on the shelf that's going to satisfy the greatest demand of the customers that are out there buying? An example that I could use is uh, one of our customers actually manufactures peanut butter. And when I was talking with that individual about forecasting, they had said, well, you know, we have two SKUs for peanut butter, smooth and crunchy. Personally, I'm a crunchy guy. I'm going to be in trouble. The majority of the sales are smooth. They are going to be hard pressed to make crunchy anytime soon because people who want peanut butter bad enough, I'll eat smooth. It's just a bias. So at the end of the day, what happens with the manufacturing of that product and the supplying it to us for inventory management and down the food chain? Not only that, what's happening with all the ingredients, packaging, labeling associated with that skew that now is going to be at least obsolete for a while. So all those things are being evaluated by our customers. The other piece of this is they're, they're also seeing that with the shift in buyers and the shift in what they've had to accommodate from an adaptability standpoint, maybe the lanes, maybe the network, maybe the supply chain that they're currently using has changed to the point that they're realizing some efficiencies, advantages, changes in what the future might look like. So some of the customers, although every year there's usually a network optimization study done, which is very smart for those organizations to provide that insight to us in our role as a supplier, now we're seeing this hasn't got anything to do with annual network optimization. This has to do with a significant change in factors within the supply chain. How do you evaluate the reliability of it and the associated risk, and how do I manage the value versus all those other downsides. That assessment is going on now with a number of major organizations that we work with. In some cases, we have RFPs that we're ready to, to uh, respond to. Some of those have been changed in the nature of what the RFP is going to speak to. Volumes have changed. Um, possibly the timing of the growth is going to change. But transition has become the word of the day. It seems like with change, you're constantly in a state of transition. The important thing is for us to work with our customers to plan as best we can in anticipation for what they see looking outward. We've also had a change in the actual, uh, sort of the old, I guess, rule of thumb was you're either near plant, near customer, near infrastructure, or ideally in a best position to take advantage of all three. Those are all being reevaluated as we speak. The other thing that is changing a lot of what's going on is shelf stable. The longer the shelf stable, the better. The greater the potential for it to be used in a fulfillment type delivery versus a typical retail or wholesale type delivery. So a lot of our customers have asked us to become more in the value added stream, reconfiguring what they have as a product to take to market to accommodate the Walmarts, Amazons, and other fulfillment type uh, online e-commerce type uh, avenues that they're entering into and finding very, very beneficial. Thanks, Jim. Your employer, Sunwill Distribution, started out as a warehousing operator, a regional player here in Western New York, and I know you have numerous facilities, but over time you've expanded into a national footprint. You're not in every state, but you are in a lot of places. I know Sunwill has operations in Nevada, Texas, New Jersey, and Michigan. Have you seen any differences in how customers in those regions are reacting to COVID-19? Jack, actually, yes. Um, we're in Utah, uh, in Reno area, and we've expanded there in the last 18 months. We're in Arlington, Texas, about to expand there. We're in uh, Covington, Georgia, just outside of Atlanta, and we're looking at customers who want us to open up operations for them there. And we're in Carlstead, New Jersey. Those are the four states we're in currently. We're looking at three or four other states with key cities 
that are either tier one, tier two, or ideally where a customer wants to have their distribution set up. Having said all of that, state to state, a lot of what Bob spoke to earlier, the regulatory environment is different, the return to work is different, the work from home is different, the attitude in some cases of the communities in those areas are different. More or less concern about the COVID requirements of masks and social distancing and those, need, those needs. When we look at that, we're operating warehouses with employees. We need to be very concerned about how those employees' health issues are gonna be managed because they're gonna be in an environment which is less restrictive or as cautious as maybe others are. That's probably been our biggest challenge. And then the old routine, if I'm going state to state, what is going on as far as the movement of freight? Um, are those lanes still open? Is the state regulating the amount of traffic or the amount of a movement of freight that's gonna be allowed within a certain market. So we constantly have to stay on top of what the regulatory environment is, is from the COVID and the community and the, the human resource side of it, as well as how we're gonna deal with the other resources that we require that may be constrained. Thanks, Jim. Mike Riccio, Leonard's Express handles both dry and refrigerated products. You mentioned that earlier in your discussion. Have you seen any have you seen any major differences between how those two sectors are reacting to COVID-19? No, I think the difference really pertains to the specific product that's shipping. So I think in general, there has been a, a pretty similar approach. The um, you know, certainly it, it really depended on, you know, what was shipping, right? If it was toilet paper, flour, I mean, you couldn't find flour, you couldn't find yeast, you couldn't find, you know, paper products. Um, but on the other hand, we haul uh, a lot of soy milk, as Jim knows, and almond milk, you couldn't, you couldn't buy that off the shelves, you couldn't find eggs. Um, we haul, as I indicated, a lot of bananas. Um, any banana, and any banana you purchase east of the Mississippi, 95% of those bananas purchased come through the port of Wilmington, Delaware. We have a terminal in Wilmington, Delaware. We normally average about 150 containers a day of bananas that we dray off the pier and bring to various destinations across the eastern seaboard. They were up to 250, 300 containers a day, and you couldn't keep up fast enough. But there were other products as Jim indicated, depending on the shelf stability and what people viewed as necessary for their house, uh, that didn't ship. So I think it wasn't necessarily a, or our experience, let me rephrase that, wasn't necessarily a dry versus reefer. It was more on what was the actual product that the manufacturer was producing. I will tell you in general, we are moving more to a refrigerated base, 75% of what we handle is refrigerated, 25% of what we handle is dry. Uh, we have consciously made that decision, um, that strategy over the course of uh, the last four or five years. So naturally, we're seeing more volatility there just because we handle more of those shipments. But again, not to be redundant, it really deemed more on the actual product versus a dry slash reefer issue. Thanks, Mike. Bob Rich, I remember when you launched Roar Logistics, you wanted to focus primarily on intermodal, but pretty quickly because of customer demand, you also branched into truckload brokerage and now do big business on both of those sectors. Have you seen any significant difference between how those two sectors are reacting to the COVID-19 situation? Well, you know, it's interesting because um, you know, domestically, um, I told you, I spoke earlier a little bit about how, you know, the drivers are being treated in terms of, you know, the pushes. And it's been great to see how much drivers are truly appreciated as, as, uh, as superheroes in this whole thing, just right along the lines of the first responders uh, and the importance of, of the, the truck driver. Um, but we have seen, you know, the challenge, big challenge, a lot of people don't think about it. It's sort of, um, you know, with multiple modes, we, we have trucks so we can do rail and we have rails so we can do truck. Um, you do see some mode shifts, but... You know, there's a big challenge because when the Lunar New Year took place in China is typically when we see imports slow down. We see the containers coming in from China that are usually coming into the, you know, to the East Coast, come in the West Coast and are reused for, uh, to head back out for, for exports or they're even used for uh, domestic repositions. 
Well, when things slowed down right at the Lunar New Year, uh, they never really picked up. So the uh, we, we talk about rail, we talk about the big boxes and the small boxes, the international 40-footers and the domestic 53-footers. So what we've seen is on the West Coast, there's been a deficit of the uh, the 53-foot equipment because it's basically staying you know on the east coast we're not getting the um the uh, domestic or the import boxes coming in on the west coast we're seeing a deficit market uh in california you do see you know that the international implications of, of what this virus has done we're mainly feeling it um you know when you talk about rail versus truck we're seeing it more uh on the rail side and as i had also said we, we've seen it on the international side where we've had to pivot and find other uh, other trade lanes to work so you know, with with truckload, like I said, we've we've been very very busy. People got to eat, people got to drink, people got to get their toilet paper and their hand sanitizer. So um, we're we're seeing that the the trucks are rolling. And so I always tell people, as long as the uh, the trucks keep rolling, we'll uh, we'll keep keep flying here. We'll keep moving uh, moving freight. So the biggest impact, like I said, and we, it could be a longer term impact, is until that uh, the confidence uh, grows. Uh, regarding the the issue in China being you know on the the tail end, uh, we are going to see deficits I think on the West Coast in terms of rail equipment uh, until the uh, the market can restabilize and I think that's a situation where you see truck filling in the gaps a little bit more um, and I think that you will see trucks responding with higher rates uh, as this deficit is realized on the West Coast maybe not so much on the East Coast uh, but with the deficit market on the West Coast I think we're going to have some real challenges. Uh, on the uh, domestic truck industry. Thanks, Bob. A uh, quick time check for everyone on the line. We're 41 minutes into the one hour, so we're at the two thirds mark and I've got enough questions here for probably the next day, but we'll cut off in about 20 minutes. Bob Rich, let me come back to you and ask, uh, what do you think or what do you see as long-term changes and impacts on what COVID-19 is going to do to all of us in the uh, logistics field? Well, I think it, as far as that goes, I think from a operations perspective, uh, we learned adaptability, we learned flexibility, we learned that everything that we do, especially as a freight brokerage and, uh, and a logistics broker, we have more opportunity to telecommute and we've realized we've got more capability than we even thought we had um, through the use of technology uh, and being, you know, operating in the cloud we're seeing that we have a better understanding and readiness. Uh, you know, God forbid this happens again. Um, we have a better readiness and understanding. And I think we'll be able to, and hopefully other companies will be able to adapt quicker in a situation uh, such as we're at right now. Um, we didn't have a game plan. We had never seen this. This isn't a hurricane. It's not flooding. It's not a snowstorm where your truck gets caught in the you know, going over the, the hills, going to the west, you know, in the west. Um, we didn't have a plan for this. So really, I think the adaptability, you'll see more telecommuting. Um, I think you'll see, you know, as I was gonna asking my guys for some of their thoughts on it, um, you know, we talked about the deficit conditions, uh, you know, increased rates. I think we're gonna see, as we know, the peak season on the west coast uh, is usually fourth quarter where you see the railroads take peak season increases due to deficits. I think you're going to see uh, peak season surcharges uh, along the lines of what we saw in 2018. I think you're going to see some higher transportation costs. Uh, I think you're going to see, you know, that uh, you know a lot of these we've been seeing trucking companies many more failures of trucking companies. So, uh, you know, it's not like we're seeing any less demand for the trucks out there, but instead, um, in a situation where there's more freight as we start to rebound. Uh, we're going to see less trucks available, which is going to create uh, probably in the long run higher rates and, uh, and more deficits. But, uh, you know, long and short of it is we see that the change from an operation standpoint is that we can be more flexible and work from home and be more adaptable through technology. And it's something that really is going to be a part of our uh, long term uh, operations plan in general to to work from home and to create more opportunities for our associates to telecommute. Thanks, Bob. And although, Bob, you and I have not coordinated our answers or discussed any of the answers here beforehand, 
one of the questions I get from companies as I go out to talk to them as a consultant is, um, what about the spot market pricing here for the fall? Uh, my advice is very similar to what I just heard you put out. Forget about any, any give in the spot market. Pricing is gonna go up. If you can sign up for a good deal today, do so. Because if you're waiting around on the sidelines for the pricing to drop in the spot market, you're gonna have a long wait coming. So react while the iron is hot. If you've got a good deal with a good price, good carrier, make your commitment now, don't wait. Mike Riccio, from your perspective, what do you see as long-term changes and impacts that all of us are gonna be wrestling with for a long time to come because of COVID-19? Well, you know, first of all, I would agree with you uh, 100%, uh, uh, you and Bob. We're already seeing, you know, as I mentioned earlier, customers moving their bids uh, up to try to lock in lower rates now, anticipating some of that. If it wasn't for the low fuel prices right now, there would be a real challenge in the marketplace. Low fuel has kept a lot of carriers in the marketplace that might not necessarily been in the marketplace before. I think as most people know, uh, like a lot of industries, the, the trucking industry is, a, is a, a low margin business and there's a lot of carriers who really were on razor thin margins who were struggling uh, and the insurance market is going to continue to knock uh, smaller carriers out of the market. Um, the, specifically as it pertains to customers requirements on excess and umbrella insurance. There's a very few people who are writing uh, that insurance right now um, I could bore you for hours with what we've had to deal with and we've had no claims on our excess insurance and our excess insurance has doubled. Um, and uh, so there, I think that that's going to impact people. I think that, um, I, I think though, similar to Bob, we, we found out that a lot of our people uh, could work from home, could telecommute, want to telecommute. Some people are more productive at home. Those who are not, we've you know are bringing back, or their job functions are such that it's it's not as productive at home. We've brought back, but I really think uh, just just technology today is not only from a workflow perspective, but from a transparency perspective, right? And and so it's all about being at, as Bob has indicated a couple of different times, pivoting and being able to adapt to what's going on. And those people who survive are going to be able to do that. I think a lot of our shippers are starting to do that. They're getting creative in how they're getting product out the door to meet the demand. They're getting creative in forward warehousing. They're getting creative in you know how what they're producing and how they're producing it. And um, but in today, it's it used to be an uninformed market. Well, today it's very informed, right? Everything's on the load boards. Everything is uh, there's all sorts of information to get, whether it pertains to supply and demand in a specific market, whether, to, whether it depends on um, you know, rates in a specific market. And I think what you're gonna see is those people who can adapt quickly and on that data and react to that data appropriately are going to succeed and those who can are gonna fail. And um, it's really become a technology race. And, and so we're trying to figure out from a technology standpoint, uh, what, is, what, what do we really want to use and what's, what's valuable and what's not, right? What's, what's a, a nice new shiny toy that's really cool, but are we really use, utilizing it and getting our return out of it? So I think it's utilizing that technology, not only for your internally, how you run your, off, your, your operations, but uh, the, what's going on in the market and being able to adapt and adjust to that uh, you know, quickly. Thanks, Mike. The one theme that I, I heard very strongly from you, Mike, and I've heard the same thing from uh, Bob and from Jim is that technology is really a differentiator. And that's one of the strong messages I deliver in the MBA class is that the future belongs to those who invest in technology. If you're going to be in logistics and do not want to invest in technology, my advice is you better start thinking of an exit strategy right now without proper technology investment, you just cannot be competitive. And I think that message is coming through loud and clear from all three panelists. Let's go back to Jim Mano. Uh, Jim, with uh, Sonwell Distribution, what kinds of long-term changes and impacts you think we're gonna see in the logistics arena once COVID-19 settles down? Jack, I think I'd have to pair, uh, pair what everyone else has said here. I mean, technology is, for us, um, been the selling point for a lot of what we've been able to win as far as opportunities to work with customers over the last few years. Now what's happened even more so 
while internally we used to look at technology to help us with our KPIs, our performance criteria and managing against some goals that we've established for what we want to do from a production standpoint, from a performance standpoint. Now, our customers are asking us to give, share some of that data with them to help them understand what's going on with their product getting to us while it's with us and when it leaves. So there's a lot more sharing of the technology and the platforms have to be able to speak to each other, which again, our team in the technology area has been working diligently to ensure. But the transparency and the ability to be able to see outward and forward thinking is based on your ability to have data and manage that data to get to a result that you're looking for. So we're seeing a lot more demand and a lot more investment by our customers in trying to improve their technology uh, from a standpoint of sharing or internally to manage their processes. <clears throat> the other is quite fine, planning. If you don't have the technology to give you the data, what are you using to plan on based what your history was and what you anticipate your future to be? And in essence, what we're doing is building a lot of automation into our warehouse operations to add more efficiencies, to ensure greater uh, ability to deliver performance at a, on a timely basis. All of that automation is tied to a technology platform that gives us the data associated with that. Again, that's the selling point to the customer. It gives them the sense that they can rely on our guidance because it's well founded with reason and evidence from history and data that we've been managing. Customers are starting to share that with us in looking at planning and forecasting. But the biggest issue for us is forecasting has taken a whole different timeline. There was a point in time when I started about 15 years ago that you would have customers that would look to three and five years, maybe even an eight year term, based on their experience with you, their own requirements, and their ability to have assurance for that period of time. Now, not only can't we get three to five, I'm looking more at one to three and a guaranteed review on a quarterly, if not semi-annual basis to ensure that we're still going to see what was forecasted six months, nine months from now, as best we can. So that has changed the timeline in which you can give any kind of reliable insight from which to plan and forecast from. <clears throat> Lastly, I would think that the more important thing is, as everyone has said, reliability. If the reliability is there, the confidence is increased. The confidence is increased. The commitment and the investment with you will be there, whether it's a current customer or one you're trying to court and bring on board. Thanks. So we're headed toward the home stretch here. One of the things I'd like all the panelists to do is to put your forecasting caps on. Jim talked about forecasting and looking into the future. All of us see and hear data coming through the news media every day. I listen to our governor, as most of you do, talk about how New York State is reacting, how many people are in intensive care, how many in the hospitals because of COVID-19. It's evident from all angles that the situation is improving. Uh, companies are reopening. Uh, we're letting people get out into the public. The economy appears to be getting stronger or people going back to work. So the big question is, how long do you think it's gonna take the US economy to regain full strength when we are totally able to overcome COVID-19 and get back to business as usual? Bob Rich, uh, how does it look to you from your perspective at Roar? Um, my feel, I mean, you just, when you just finished that, the, the first thing that popped in my head is 18 to 24 months. Um, you know, just as you were saying it, just a number just, just came to my head, I'm just like 18, 24 months, why? And I'm asking myself why. And I, I think that the reason being why is we have to go through another cycle. Uh, we have to go through that one year anniversary of when this hit. We have to go through knowing that we're gonna get through the flu season, we're gonna get through the one year anniversary of when this hit. And that's, you know, that's uh, another nine months out here. Then we have to get through the, the time that we were in this pandemic there's just gonna be a cautious sense. It's it's like you know falling off a bike. You get back on. You're a little tentative, you know, and you you like to think that we're gonna keep going in the right direction, but we realize that you know that one person on one plane could cause you know one big problem. Um, they say that uh, never doubt that one person can change the world. Well, one person did. Patient zero changed the world for all of us. Um, so my thoughts on that are, you know, we have to get back to a new normal. And I don't think the new normal looks like the old normal. 
and long and short of it is the economy was humming. We were here. This is our freight level, okay? We were trending like this. And then what happens? You go from here down to here in terms of freight, okay? Freight dropped off. So as we approach the new normal, I don't think we're going to quite get to that level of where we were before. Because think about it, restaurants, dining out, you know, everything that we're used to doing, there's a caution, there's a wearing of a mask, there is, you know, a, a, a tentative nature to us as a society to come back from this. And I think it's a good thing that we've taken our time, but it's going to take people a long time to get used to walking in public without uh, a, a paranoia or a fear of somebody sneezing and, and, and you immediately are doing this because you don't want to get sick again. So I think that uh, 18 to 24 months seems like uh, the most you know, realistic. Uh, it may take longer, but I think it really, we have a, a tremendous resolve uh, as a country. And I, I think that that is a very realistic and very uh, attainable goal. Thanks, Bob. I would uh, tend to concur with you that when this thing first hit, many of us, including me, thought a relatively short-term recovery. But as it goes on, it's pretty clear that it's not a one to two month recovery. The question is, is it a year or two years? Um, nobody knows. We won't know till we live through it. Certainly, I've seen analyses come from the federal government from the economic side, and they're saying nine years before we see the full impact. Hopefully, it's not that long. But it's pretty clear this is not a one to two month recovery. And as much as all of us have trepidation and concern, it's pretty clear that until we get a vaccine, uh, it's, it's a roll of the dice that uh, we're all taking some kind of risk, but uh, we'll have to see what happens. Mike Riccio, what does your crystal ball tell you about uh, the impact of COVID-19 and when will the recovery hit us? Well, it's hard to argue what Bob said. I think I would, I, would, I would agree at least a couple of years. And, and for me, it's all about the jobs, right? How many people are out of work? Uh, as they start to get back into the work, their buying habits are going to change. People recognized what they could live with and what they could live without. Are they going to be spending money at the restaurants? Are they going to be spending money on maybe some of those uh, discretionary, uh, those nice but not necessary type items because they're worried about losing their job again and maybe not having the government there to bail things out like it has this time. Um, so I, I think that that has just changed the people's buying behaviors and, and, and what they will and will not spend their money on. And when you've got several people out of work in your household or one person out of work, you start to recognize, oh, I don't necessarily need this or need that. And I think, uh, I think that's just going to change things and it's just going to take time, a much, more long, a much longer time for the economy and for things to gain steam the way, without any external uh, situation occurring that would impact it. But I, I would echo what both of you have just said. Thanks, Mike. Jim Mano, what's your view on the length of the recovery before things are back to normal? Well, I had the same reaction when I heard that that uh, Bob shared, 18 to 24 months. But I think there's a, a part of this that still is so uncertain, and it's that middle class and lower wage earner that's going to be relying on an ability to have a job and an income and get comfortable again with what they can afford and how they're going to win, either spend their money or invest their money. And that's a huge part of our population that are consumers that buy the products and services that I know at Sinwell, we help get to the market. So 18 to 24 months. I'm also very familiar with a few other industries having a son who's in the restaurant business and a daughter who's in healthcare and another daughter who's in international uh, finance. And they're all looking at the same questions being asked of them. And every one of them likes to look at well, what do you mean by full recovery? Define that for me first. What is normal? Because everyone's, when are we going to get back to normal? No, it, it will never be your normal again. So there's a lot of convincing and caution and trepidation about suggesting that we're ready, when we'll be ready, and why. Because there are a lot of factors that are still yet to be played out. And just as Bob and Mike said, we may have another um, experience with this and learn more or less and be better prepared the next time. 
but we aren't there yet. If there isn't a vaccine or something to mitigate the effect of the virus, um, there aren't any solutions that I can see that are out there that's gonna change that dynamic. Thanks, Jim. We're nearing the end of the hour. There's one specific question that's been posted, and I'll handle that one. It has to do with the bullwhip effect, uh, the fact that uh, our toilet tissue usage obviously isn't increasing, even though most of us are spending time at home. Our bathroom habits haven't changed because of uh, COVID-19, but yet we're running out of toilet tissue at the supermarkets. Is that an example of the bullwhip effect? And the bullwhip effect is something we teach in school, and uh, essentially it has to do with demand amplification, that if the store has a computer that says order 10 cases of toilet tissue, the person doing the ordering, and we would all be in the same boat, would say, gee, there's a lot of demand. Computer says 10, I'll order 15. When that order goes to the wholesaler, the wholesaler sees, gee, this person ordered 15. I better bump that up and make sure we've got enough. I'll take it to 20. The next person takes it to 25. And so it, it amplifies the demand way beyond what is reasonable. Uh, I was interviewed on COVID-19 in the supply chain by Mary Alice Demler on Channel 2 a couple of weeks ago, and she really made me smile when she started the interview, and she said, Jack, can you tell me about the bullwhip effect? I said, you know about that, Mary Alice? She said, well, actually, I studied ahead, and I, I found that term. I said, well, we teach that in college, and absolutely, this is a classic example of the bullwhip effect that the total demand hasn't changed, and yet we're getting shortages because people are overreacting and uh, trying to do the best they can to protect themselves. Uh, the word to the wise for all of us is uh, buy the stuff that you need. If you don't like the price, buy the stuff you do like. Um, the supply chain isn't broken. We're getting spurts in demand we're all trying to respond to. Uh, the only thing that's really hurting us is the fact that factories are shut down. If the factories are cranking out, you've heard from three terrific logistics companies here, they can move the products. They can get those to the marketplace and keep all of us uh, going, going along in life. So that's the end of the, the one hour. I'd like to thank our panelists, uh, Jim Mano, Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Sunwell Distribution, Mike Riccio, Chief Marketing Officer for Leonard's Express in Farmington, New York, and Bob Rich, President of Aurora Logistics uh, based in Buffalo. And with that, it's the end of the session today. Thank you all for attending and we'll catch you at the next session. <laughs>